Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to LD at School's fourth webinar for the 2022-2023 school year. Uh, my name is Susanna Miller, and I will be the moderator for this afternoon. If anyone is experiencing any technical difficulties um, at this time, you can contact our team using either the Q&A box or the chat function, um, and we will do our best to assist you. After the webinar, we'll be sending out presentation slides, a link to the survey um, that will provide us some feedback on the webinar. And in approximately three weeks, we'll send out a link to the webinar recording that is being transcribed and closed captioned, and it will be sent to all of our participants. If you would like to have a copy of our slides right now, I will uh, pop the address of our Padlet into the chat. So, but you can just see this is our Padlet here. And you can see all of our webinars so far this year and access the slides just by scrolling down. And the slides are right there. So uh, with that in mind, we will move on. If you have any technical questions or you would like to chat with us on the team, the Q&A box and the chat box are available at the bottom of the screen. I will um, uh, enable the chat function in just a moment when I'm done talking here. So with all that sort of housekeeping out of the way, the LD at School is very pleased to welcome two of our own, uh, Martin Smith and Allison Cousineau Grant, whose presentation this afternoon is entitled Rethinking the IEP for Struggling Readers. The Ministry of Education has provided funding for this production. Please note that the views expressed in this webinar are the views of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the Ministry of Education nor the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario. We will also be tweeting throughout the webinar, so if you'd like to join our conversation online, uh, you can send us a tweet by using our handle, which is at the bottom of the screen there, at LD at school, or by using the hashtag, hashtag LD webinar. So please join me in welcoming our presenters for the day, Martin Smith and Alison Cousineau Grant. Martin is the English language educational consultant for LDAO. He has over 30 years of experience uh, as a classroom teacher, a music teacher, administrator, and system principal for Hastings and Prince Edward uh, District School Board, as well as Greater, Greater Essex District School Board. And he was a principal for the Provincial and Demonstration Schools branch. Martin has facilitated workshops at a number of educational conferences, including Quest, the Educators Institute, and Asset. He is a member of the LD at School Advisory Committee and was previously a member of the LDAO Board of Directors. He's a strong ag advocate for all students and supports school-wide data-driven strategies for addressing learning needs. Alison Cousineau Grant, bear with me as I try to speak French, it's not gonna be good, um, has worked with the Conseil de, des Écoles Publiques de l'Est d'Ontario um, for the last 13 years, maybe even more, um, with children and adolescents who have a variety of communication difficulties, including difficulties in speech, language, reading, and writing. She also provides assessment and intervention services with preschool and school-age children as a private practice. In these varied contexts, she collaborates with the teaching staff and special education technicians to support them in their interventions with special needs students in the classroom setting. This strong collaboration allows her to identify and integrate winning strategies for supporting such students. Uh, Ms. Grant focuses her efforts on language, reading, and writing disorders, as well as on augmented, augmentative and alternative communication. So with all that behind us, Martin and Allison, the floor is now yours. You are muted. <laughs> that was my best joke too i Aww, can't believe that you can try it okay well thank you very much Susanna. i just on behalf of allison and i um we wanted to say how pleased we are to be here and um thank to you to everyone who's uh joined us today and uh, we hope that you have half as much fun uh, today as we had putting this together because um we really did enjoy challenging each other and um you know looking for for new ways to kind of think about the iep and i'm hoping that uh 
I'm up on the screen now. Is that right, Susanna? We're all good? You are all good. There, oh, there we go. Okay, and we're off to the races. So I think what we're going to do is we're just going to start out with a little bit of um, the plan for today. And so we've broken the, the webinar down into uh, kind of four pieces. And one is going to be just looking at the IEP, a little bit of a review of, of what the IEP is and the components of it. And then Allison's going to take us a little bit through the Right to Read report. Then we're going to pick that IEP apart a little bit. We're going to look at a couple of the components of it. We're going to explore maybe how it could be reshaped or rethought to better meet the needs of, of our struggling readers. And you'll notice that we're using the term struggling readers and not just students uh, with dyslexia or students with learning disabilities, but we're kind of grouping everyone together who might be struggling. And then we talk a little bit about where we might go from here. And the fun of this webinar is that this is this is not an, an information dump and this is not a, a lesson that we're trying to teach you about how to use an IEP, but what we're really trying to do is is get people to think a little bit differently, um, perhaps about how the IEP could be reshaped um, uh, to better meet the needs of students who are struggling. And that inc includes all the students in your class, and of course, specifically those with, with special needs. So I like to start here. Um, I think, you know, we start at the very beginning, which is the very best place to start. And uh, why not head right to the ministry? And if we have a look at the ministry website, which uh, houses this document that you see there, the Individual Education Plan Resource Guide, um, which is, I believe it's only available online. I don't think Queen's Press makes those uh, hard copies available anymore. But their opening statement really talks about this IEP. It says, why an IEP? Um, there are many students who have educational needs that cannot be met through the regular instruction and assessment practices at schools. And I thought, you know, it's a pretty simple and innocent statement, but if you really take a minute and let that roll around in your brain for a few minutes, I think this is our first little exercise to say, can we start rethinking some of the components of this IEP? And what I start to think about is, is it truly possible or is it acceptable that we are saying there are so many students whose needs cannot be met through the regular instruction and assessment practices in the regular education system? So it makes us wonder, that you know, maybe there are some flaws in the education system. Maybe there are flaws in the way we're doing things. And and you know, hopefully by the end of the I of of the uh, webinar, we're going to be able to look at this statement maybe through some different eyes and say, is it possible that that word "many students" can be changed to you know, most students can have their needs met? And with that, I'm going to turn it over. Um, Oh, wait, no, I guess I was <laughs> sorry, Allison. I'm saying I think I said it already that I hope that that we're really going to give some serious consideration to how we deliver education in Ontario and the possibilities to making some changes. But I also want to say this webinar is really specifically about how we teach reading. So we're not looking at, you know, saying there should be no IEPs for children at all in Ontario. But what, um, what we're talking about is specifically the reading component in an IEP. How are we going to use that? But I think that we would be able to to extrapolate some of that thinking to some of the other subject areas as well. <clears throat> So here's another statement that comes same from the same website, and uh, you know it, it's uh, it's whoops what's happened here. It talks about the IEP, kind of gives that 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 simple summary of what it is, and I'm pretty sure that everybody is familiar um, with this statement. You know, it's a written document. It describes special education programs and accommodations, and down at the bottom there it says, you know, IEPs are based on a thorough assessment of student strengths, needs, and ability to learn and demonstrate their learning. Well, I started thinking about that again, and, and I really sort of let that roll around in my brain, and some things really started to stick out for me. And if we have a look at the highlighted area, this idea of thorough assessment, I really started to, to sort of think about that in, in, in my mind and think, have we really done thorough assessments in terms of reading? And for me, the answer was no, I don't know that we've ever been able to really create a thorough assessment or description of learning needs when it comes to reading. And that's not a criticism of education, but rather just an observation based on what we now know about effective reading instruction. And I felt the same about the part that says the ability to learn and demonstrate learning. And that's because with the release of the Right to Read report, and the new attention on evidence-based instruction, we now have a new understanding of our students' ability to learn and how their learning can be demonstrated. 
And I think maybe we're just going to move on, Allison, quickly to a little shameless promotion for LD at school. I'm sure many of you know that um, the Learning Disabilities Association of Ontario has a project called LD at School, and that's, of course, who's presented um, or makes this webinar available for you today. But on our website, ldatschool.ca, you'll find, uh, I think, about 300 free resources for you to use. There's also... Um, a, a mirrored website that's available in French, and almost all of these resources have been um, uh, translated uh, between French and English, so they're all available for anybody. And we wanted to just highlight one of these. This is a very recent video that was created called What is an IEP? And we're just going to take a look at a little tiny snippet of this. An, effe an effective IEP helps a student access the curriculum through strategies and interventions that support individual strengths and needs. The IEP is also a tool of accountability and helps determine how a student's progress is measured and reported to the parent. So just a tiny little piece of that video. Um, you're more than welcome to head down to the website and, and have a look at that if you wanted to uh, see the whole video. It was really kind of created with, with maybe newer teachers in mind as a, as a review on the IEP. But just that little section, again, brought out some things that, that really had me starting to think. So the first thing that I started to think about was just the title of that section, An Effective IEP. And I start to think, are there actually ineffective IEPs? Like, is that possible in Ontario that we could create a, you know, a, a document that wasn't effective? When we look at words like strategies and interventions, I didn't hear the word evidence-based strategies mentioned at all. And it really started to me to wonder, what is the relationship between that? Is an evidence is evidence-based instruction a strategy, or is evidence-based instruction what we should be using and the strategies and interventions? fall below that. And finally, just the talk about measuring and reporting to parents. Again, a very important term that I found missing there was about progress monitoring to say, are we re do we really know that our students are moving forward and what the next steps are going to be for them? And that brings us right back to that slide that we saw at the beginning saying that many students are not having their needs met by the educational system. And I think that I'd like to really to keep that in mind as we move forward. And now I'm just going to turn it over to Allison and she's going to tell us a little bit about the Right to Read report. Thank you, Martin. So basically with the um, uh, Right to Read report, what happened is on October 3rd, 2019, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, so OHRC, announced a public inquiry into human rights issues that affects students uh, with reading disabilities in Ontario's public education system. And basically in this uh, inquiry that is called the Right to Read report, um, it found that Ontario's public education system is failing students with reading disabilities. So we can hear we can talk about LD or we can talk about dyslexia, but also many other students because they're not using evidence-based approaches to teach them to read. So the report itself calls for critical changes to Ontario's approach to early reading. And more specifically, they're talking about areas such as the curriculum, um, instruction, screening, reading intervention, accommodations, and professional assessments um, as well. So with this uh, release of the report, um, it was finally released on February 28th, uh, 2022. And it includes 157 recommendations to the Ministry of Education of Ontario, to school boards as well, as well as the faculties of education on how to address systemic issues that affect the right to learn to read. And the report itself combines um, research, human rights expertise, and uh, lived experience of students, parents, and educators to provide those recommendations on curriculum and instruction, early screening, uh, reading intervention, accommodation, and so forth. And so the goal here is that the implementation of the um, Ontario Human Rights uh, Report and recommendations, we want to ensure that it's more equitable, uh, there are more equitable opportunities, sorry, and outcomes for those students in um, Ontario's public education system. 
So with that, the question is, what was the ministry's response to the right to read report? So they invested $25 million for evidence-based reading intervention programs and professional assessments to support learning recovery and enable school boards to immediately begin meeting the needs of struggling readers. And again, like Martin uh, mentioned, here we're talking really about struggling readers and not necessarily dyslexia or LD, though. So those that have um, diagnoses. So as you can imagine, um, what we can do with that $25 million, well, that translates um, to different things in each school board, each school for each student. So it can really vary tremendously from one end of the province to another, or even from one city to another. So with that $25 million, the ministry also specified um, some general goals. So if Martin, if you just move it to the next slide. So first, um, they talked about revising the elementary language curriculum and the grade nine English course with scientific evidence-based uh, approaches that really emphasize direct, explicit, and systematic instruction and removing references to unscientific discovery or inquiry-based learning, including the three-cued system. And all of this, by 2023. So we are already in 2023. Uh, for those of you who work with the French curriculum, for example, this would be a goal for the Francophone students' uh, education as well. In line with this, the ministry released a science-based guide for educators in the spring of 2022 to support effective uh, early reading instruction. This being said, yes, it is a guide for teachers. It is a start, but there is missing a significant amount of information. So for example, information on screeners and more um, details regarding that. Uh, the ministry emphasized the importance of wanting to collaborate with partners, um, including faculties of education, uh, and more specifically, when we talk about professional development for educators to ensure that there are learning science-based reading instruction methods. And it has also been a goal for the government to begin developing a French language reading intervention program. But unfortunately, it doesn't isn't quite the reality yet. In fact, when reading the right to read report, um, the French version of the report, it's pretty clear that the French perspective when it comes to the science of reading and evidence-based practice fundamentals that need to be shared and that need to be considered um, with the French perspective, this was all more so an afterthought um, in the report. So that's something to take in consideration for those who do work with um, French speaking students or who work in school boards that offer both English and French um, education. And lastly, the ministry wants to engage with parents and sector partners on a longer term response and developing accessible parent friendly resources uh, on literacy. And I'll send it back to you, Martin. Thanks, Allison. So I was recently um, at a session where a question was posed to the ministry regarding the status of the IEP guidelines and the exemplars that are being used and saying essentially, when are they going to be updated? And this was the answer. It says, that they said, the ministry continues to review the standards and development committee recommendations and the right to read inquiry report. And, you know, essentially that when that is done, there will be direction around IEP policy and um, essentially saying that that at this point, we know, you know, the, the speed at which many committees work. And it doesn't mean that they're not doing good work, but it doesn't mean that it always comes in in a timely manner. So we know that um, there has been direction given from the ministry to district school boards around the work um, that needs to be done regarding the recommendations of the right to read. And just last month, the ministry actually announced more plans to support early reading. They, they announced supports for students, um, uh, training for educators in reading instruction, screening tools coming forward, evidence-based reading supports, and the implementation of the new language curriculum. So there's some really good direction being given to district school boards around uh, the right to read report. But um, this now is kind of leaving a bit of a glaring inconsistency between the direction for reading instruction and the actual guidelines for the IEP. 
right? So we're on a new track uh, for reading instruction, but an old track for supporting reading in an individual education plan. So boards and, educa and educators, I think, are going to have to really do some thinking and make some decisions on how IEPs are created and implemented in the 2023-24 school year if we don't get some directions. And that's where we're going to move to now is just, you know, some, some thinking that, that might help us uh, get ready for the changes that are going to come. forgot to unmute myself. So where are we today? So today each school board is continuing to provide support for the development of IEPs to really make sure that the educators are responding to students' uh, literacy needs and supporting them with evidence-based practice. And I'd like to emphasize here that it's really with this idea of implementing um, evidence-based practice into the IEP, <clears throat> sorry, the IEP process. And so when we talk about evidence-based practice, we don't want it to just be a buzzword, but a true and true practice standard in our educational system. When it comes to IEPs, many teachers, resource teachers, learning support teachers, or, or whatever term you may use, will sometimes struggle with how to properly target or, or formulate IEP learning expectations, so learning goals. Um, and there are many samples that are available to you. So for example, um, you can find some on edge, edge gains or in code. Um, but even with that said, educators do have decisions to make regarding the current format of the IEP. And it is in um, conflict with both the recommendations of the uh, Ontario Human Rights Commission and the direction of the Ministry of Education of Ontario. So that brings us, or with that said, um, I think this is a perfect moment for us to really dive into those sections um, of the IP that may be a little bit uh, harder to understand or where we feel um, some sort of detail or more detail is needed. So Martin, you can just go to the next slide. Um, so here we're showing you uh, one of the sections in the IEP, which is uh, the table where we would usually find, it's usually near the beginning of the IEP, with all the relevant assessment data. So for most educators, this table usually provides results from psychological testing or uh, psychological assessment or educational assessments. And a lot of the information provided will be general in nature. So the psychological assessment will have some relevant information and recommendations, of course. Um, it'll talk about diagnoses and so forth. Um, when it comes to grade level assessments, for example, um, see, these don't really give an, a, an indication of the specific needs of the student's reading ability. And sometimes the psychological assessment, like I said, will be more general in nature uh, as well, all depending. So it's not to say that this information isn't um, pertinent, it's not important. It does give us a general picture of what the student skills are, but sometimes we forget that we can add our own tools here and we can provide our own summary of results and our own summary of our observations or what we have as data. And it will give us that detail that um, we would really like to have. And inside the Right to Read report, there are recommendations, for example, that state that all students should be screened twice a year. And here we're talking about in this particular recommendation from the Right to Read report from um, kindergarten to grade two. So this, if we do screen um, students twice a year, this would give us that data I'm talking about, especially if a student wasn't progressing after grade two even if we didn't have a psychological assessment or a psychological assessment that is um, um, updated um, or done in, in, uh, in, in the last few months, then we would still have all that data from that child being screened twice a year. So it would also give us data on interventions that have been implemented. And this would all be valuable information for the IEP. So with that being said, I think this is a perfect moment for us to start our first activity together because we really want this to be um, interactive. 
Um, and we want to hear from you. So we want to give you the opportunity to really reflect and share your thoughts on this particular piece of the IEP. So our question to you is, what are some of the current tools you have that might be a better fit in this section of the IEP? So Martin, you can take us to the Jamboard now. Yeah, Alison, just before we did that, it was just one thing that I was thinking that what you were saying, what's a better fit? And one of the assessments that we saw on there was the PM benchmarks, right? And, you know, there's been a lot of discussion around grade level assessments, reading assessments that we're using. And I think that there's still a lot of educators who are not really sure why is right to read saying that the grade level assessments aren't really the right thing. And what is it that we use? And um, instead of that, and why don't we use them? So that was another piece that I thought as we move into the, um, into the jam board um, if if there's some some questions you want to pose around that you could you could probably pop them in there as well there that we should go. be up allison yeah oh great everybody's already starting to to write things down so you'll see on the pink post-it um we already provided one example for example um one example for example <laughs> so the phonological awareness screening test uh the past is one that uh, we could possibly use as a screener or as a tool and we could report on some of the information that we get from there so i see that everybody is adding this is great i love it We'll give I can you guess. I can guess some of the boards that we're hearing from based on the tools that they're <laughs> that they're mentioning. That's great. I'll be honest. I work for a French uh, public school board, um, so there's a lot of these tools that I'm less familiar with because I just don't work in English. So Martin, you're gonna have to help me out here. <laughs> A tool that I have used, um, because I do have to sometimes screen kids in English, is uh, the PASS, so the Phonological Awareness Skills Screener. Um, and we'll see once everybody's had the opportunity to put down their ideas. So I see in the chat we talk about um, GB+, so we can discuss that as well. Um, but once we've had the chance to um, put some ideas down, you'll see that um, these are all tools that you'll be able to put in the information source part of that table. Um, instead of putting psychological assessment, you can put these tools, for example. So I see that there are some that uh, are coming back more, more than yeah. once. Alexia. And I'm, I'm just going to mention as this is going on, I'm doing all the ads today, but um, in a couple of weeks, we have another webinar um, going that's going to be going on. And it's, it's kind of more directed to senior teams, but everyone is welcome, of course, our central teams. I mean, they're talking a little bit about um, how do you do sy systematic change uh, when it comes to science of reading or the right to read report? And one of the pieces that we're going to be talking about are resources. How are they selected by boards? And we'll be compiling a list there. So I'm sure there's a lot because there's a lot of resources I don't recognize here as well. Um, so if, if people are you know, not sure about that, you might want to join us for that webinar and or at least have a look after it's done at the recording and the list of the resources that come out of that. So this is really great, all um, great tools. Like I said before, we see that some of them are coming back more than once. So we see that there's still, there's a certain consistency in what is being used in different boards. That's I don't great. think any of the, I think we pretty much have all the ones, doesn't seem to be any additions. 
So we're going to share these jam boards with you um, later as well. Um, so for those who see maybe um, tools that you know they haven't had the chance to explore before, and it, you know you you want a list of them, then you'll have access to these jam boards at a later date to be able to kind of go like, oh, what is the past or what's Lexia and and so forth. So Martin, when you feel like it's a good time, we can go to the next slide. Perfect. So here I just get, well here, we just gave um, a little uh, example of that table that we had seen beforehand with psychological assessment or PM benchmarks. And here, uh, we're just giving you the opportunity to see what it would look like with some of those tools or those screeners um, that you may be already using and that would be really important or pertinent to add to, um, to the IEP uh, assessment data. So for example, if you're someone who's using uh, the PASS, um, then you can write phonological awareness skills screener in the information source. And then in the summary report, we can provide our general impressions. So here we specified that there are difficulties with phonological awareness skills. And more specifically, we just mentioned that it was with phoneme awareness. So sound recognition, blendings, segmentation, and deletion. Uh, second tool was a simple letter sound tracker. Um, so here you can simply write a letter sound tracker, even if it doesn't have a specific name. And then um, you can just say how the, the student, um, how the student did on that particular tracker. So in this case, there were no difficulties with letter sound correspondence. Um, and um, the teacher felt that the child was at a grade level performance. And then any other tool that you would feel is necessary, such as the National Assessment of Educational Progress Fluency Scale. Um, and here it's not, you know, you can uh, specify that it's level one, but it's always nice to have um, maybe a little bit more uh, specific information, such as saying that he rated, the child rated as non-fluent. And when we say non-fluent, well, he was reading mostly at a word-by-word -word level versus at a two, three, or four word um, kind of cluster uh, level. So those little bits of information are going to be uh, bits of information that you can use and it'll be more relevant data than just knowing that the child has, you know, reading difficulties that the, 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 the specifics that you're, you're using will help you later with our next section, which is the areas of um, strengths and need. And also when it comes time to target learning expectations, those summary of results will also help with those uh, with all those specifications. I just want to add to Allison that I think, yeah. you know, looking at some of the the, the contributions to the Jamboard, um, some of those, a uh, couple of them were are a little controversial. And um, I think that, you know, it just really highlights the importance that school boards um, do their homework around the right to read and around science of reading and evidence-based instruction to say, if you're using relevant assessment, it needs to be evidence-based, right? It can't just be because the program looks good that you pick it up and use it. And that's what we know about, about leveled assessments and a lot of other assessments that are mentioned in that right to read report that we have to be very careful that just because we feel that they're a good assessment for our class doesn't necessarily mean that that's true. So um, if you're putting, it says relevant assessment data, it needs to be evidence-based and it needs to be um, supporting evidence-based instruction for our students. Perfect. So let's move on to our other section um, and it's the students' areas of strengths and needs. So when we look at this table, uh, you can write in the chat, but I just have a little general question to the group of what are you noticing in this table? What is your first impression when you see 
the strengths and the needs that are um, listed here. Too many needs, unbalanced, high level. So, oh, I thought someone else had sent in a message, too general. So that's something that we had noticed as well, is that although there is some good information here, such as visual learner, knowing that, you know, we're targeting more specifically receptive language versus expressive language, and we're looking at processing speed and so forth, we did feel like it is very general in, uh, in nature. So if we look at the second area of strength, for example, receptive language skills, listening, what does that really mean? Is that specific enough? Um, same thing with the needs. So we have receptive language skills again, but then we have reading. So when I think of reading, I immediately have a lot of questions like what area of reading? Are we talking about precision? Are we talking about fluency? Are we talking about comprehension? If we're talking about precision, are we talking more, um, you know, information or, or skills that are relating to decoding? Are we talking about letter sound correspondence? So although we would think that it is maybe specific because we're saying about well, which receptive language skills we're talking about reading, but reading is just such a big category and we can be a lot more specific. And I think parents would really appreciate it being a lot more specific. I'm going to take one little minute to just give an example of an IPRC meeting that I had the other day with a parent who, you know, was saying, well, you know, the, the, the areas of strength and the areas of need that are in this uh, document are the same that have been there for the last year or the last two years. And she noted that it was very general and that it didn't really tell her what her son's actual areas of strengths were because or areas of need because she, and she said the same thing that I just said which is reading is just so fast so you know yeah we know he has trouble reading but then there's other things that he is able to do when it comes to reading so you know is it possible to have certain components of reading in the areas of needs and other components of uh, reading that are in the areas of strength and I felt like that was a really good question and it made me really reflect. So that being said, I think this would be a great time to tackle our second activity, um, which is, is how can we be more specific when we're detailing a student's strengths and needs? So Martin, you can um, put up the second Jamboard now. Again, if we look at the second uh, Jamboard, we put uh, an example of student is a visual learner. So sometimes in the areas of strength or in the areas of needs, whichever, you know, we'll talk about a learning style, you know, and we want to be specific. So he's a visual learner. Is there something else that we can um, add to, to make that even more specific? I'm just looking in a chat here. I see too high level means less accountability and non-targeted. So here I would just love for everyone to kind of add, how can we be more specific? You can uh, rely on the areas of uh, strengths and the area of needs that we had already given um, as an example, and just you know reflect on how would you say that differently or how would you be more specific so that whether it be for the teacher for the school team or for the parents, how can that information be better used and then help you further down with other aspects or other sections of the IEP? I really struggled with this section, trying to recognizing that it was too general, but then trying to say, how do you make it more specific? You know, because you just, do it for decoding or for reading how to, and you realize that it's, you know, in some ways it's, it's the whole box itself that maybe is the problem, right? That it needs to be opened up in a different way to, to allow us to get the information that we need to put in there. 
There's some great, uh, great notes coming on the board. I really like this idea of make it specific to the student. Sometimes we do maybe put uh, labels or more general comments that can be applied to different students. And how can we make it that, you know, I, the, I'll say I or the parent really sees their child when that particular description is used. Yeah, and there's a comment in the chat there that someone mentioned exactly that, Allison, saying it's a pet peeve and the comment just gets carried over year after year after year, right? And I have to admit, when that parent made the comment, I had a smile on my face and I was like, she is not wrong, you know? <laughs> I too, as a parent, would be frustrated if I kept seeing the same things over and over. And I was like, but what does that mean? Does that mean he's not progressing? Does that mean that, you know, we don't know my child? What does that mean? So I'm seeing comments such as anecdotal specific, i.e. what was observed. I also see on one of the post-its when we're talking about goals, that goals that are measurable. So definitely that's gonna help us later when we talk about learning expectations. I'm also seeing add a next step that student can work towards. So that's making me think if you can describe that area of need, what was that previous step that now this student has mastered? And maybe that's something that you can put in the area of strength. Yeah, good comment around comprehension there too, is to say, you know, because it's broken down, it gives you a much clearer picture whether you're dealing with fiction or nonfiction texts, text, rather than a, just a blanket statement, they have good comprehension or they don't have good comprehension, right? Can vary so much. There's a comment in the chat, Allison, that says, I thought learning styles was debunked. It's a good comment. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know much about that. I, I think that it, it comes a little bit to what we're talking about, too, is to say, if you're going to talk about learning styles, at least be specific. And, and you know, if you just, I'm not sure what you mean by learning styles, but we were, I think, later we were saying, like, a, like if you're talking about being a visual learner or, you know, auditory or whatever. But I think, again, th those are such general terms, like, what do you mean by that, right? And if a child is a visual learner, you know, what, what is the child able to do or what support is works for that child that makes us think he's a visual learner, even if we don't have a, a certain um, document or a certain assessment that, you know, told us that he's a visual learner. Oh, there you go. I just Googled it. There is no credible evidence that learning styles exist, it says. So I'll have to look a little more about that. Cedar Reiner and in, in, uh, 2022. They're saying students may have preferences about how they learn, but there's no evidence to suggest that catering to these preference preferences will lead to better learning. So a good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Definitely. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's true that, you know, someone can be a visual learner, but still, you know, um, benefit from other types of support, yeah. such as like kinesthetic and so forth. And that's why I was saying, if we can be a bit more specific as to what is it that makes us think he's a visual learner, then we can kind of go from there without using the label visual learner. Okay, should we move on, do you think? Yeah. 
I'll put it um, back to the other. Do you want me to go back or? Yes, please. There we go. So we can go to the next slide. So as you see here, we tried in the best that we could just to see how can we go and be more specific. I know I'm I'm repeating myself a lot, um, but you know if if in the areas of strength we talk about previously acquired learning skills, um, then maybe we can talk about you know instead of writing previously acquired learning skills, why don't we say that you know it's a student who can ex access background knowledge, for example. If we're talking about, you know, an area of strength is cognitive processing and communication abilities, what do we mean by that? We're saying that he has good receptive comprehension skills, for example. In the areas of needs, so, you know, if we talk about uh, skill deficits that relate to the student's exceptionality and or interfere with the student's ability to learn, that's more specific. There's a lot more words. We may think it's more specific, but can we be even more specific than that? So we're suggesting here, like, well, maybe we can talk about an area of need being executive functioning skills. And we can be even more specific by saying of the different executive functioning skills that exist, his difficulty or her difficulty is really in planning or time management. So there's a lot of these, these skills, these behaviors um, that we know and we see it. And when we describe a child, we'll use these terms. So let's use them in the IEP tables as well. And then we'll be able to be really, give really pertinent and, and detailed information. For example, if we're saying an area of need is social interactions, or we're saying that social interactions require support, then maybe we can be more specific by saying, Yes, he needs help with social interactions, but more specifically, we're talking about when he's dealing or she is dealing with conflict resolution. So this way, a parent doesn't think like, oh boy, like, you know, social interactions has been an area of need for a couple of years now, but I feel like, you know, he's, he's progressed in that area. Well, by being more specific and talking about the fact that it's more with dealing with conflict resolution, then the parent can see like, oh, okay, yes, definitely that is still an area of need for my child. Well, the third piece of the IP we wanted to look at was the, the program section, the special education program. And so this is really the meat and potatoes, right? This is where it all seems to come together. And I have to tell you that when we pulled this off, and, and these these uh, samples were just pulled off of um, the ministry exemplars that are available online, and I believe this is a grade six, um, uh, grade six IEP. And I I think my comment to Allison when we were putting this together was, oh, like where do we even start here? Like after the work that we've done and the comments that we've already seen in the activities, I know that when you start looking at this, that, that people have to kind of think, really, like, how could you even implement something like this? And recognizing that these are old exemplars, right? And we, we have come a long way in our understanding and development of IEP since then, but I think it's still a good exercise. So we wanted to change things up a little bit here and not just, just keep rebuilding the chart. So what I thought we would do to start with is make use of the chat boxes. And if you just do a quick look through uh, some of the sections of this special education program, and maybe we deconstruct it a little bit and uh, don't be too mean, but you know, um, maybe make some comments in the chat around some of the things that you don't think are appropriate or good strategies or good goals um, for, for reading on an IEP. So just put them in the chat for now. You can look at the specific learning expectations, teaching um, strategies, assessment methods. If you want to look at the program goals. Yeah. 
yeah, teaching strategies are not really strategies. tools used for assessment. I was thinking the same thing. I was looking at the observations and the checklists and <laughs> things like that. Well, we're not going to belabor this too much because I think it's pretty clear that, you know, the examples that, that we have here are, are not really the very best. They're not precise. Um, a lot of them, like they said, are not clear learning expectations and don't have strategies that are clearly linked. So we're going to take you into one last Jamboard. And this time, um, what we'd like you to do is really just focus on this learning expectations section. And Allison and I had some discussions around the learning expectations, whether we should be trying to do strategies and assessment methods as well. But we're both believing that if you have clear and precise learning expectations, it would be, be much easier to have the teaching strategies and the assessment methods follow from that. They would be very, very clear. So why don't we take a couple of minutes and just think about some more precise learning expectations that might um, make it easier uh, to, to instruct a student with these kinds of needs. And they can be anything. They don't have to be related to the previous activities at all. But if you just think of any student you might have in your class that's struggling with reading, um, what's one expectation that might be good for them to be working on? I don't see any coming up, Allison, do you? No, oh, there we, we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it kind of like popped up all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> I was nervous there for a minute. Yeah, I think clearly people understand when you look at something like CVCs or, uh, you know, phonemic awareness skills or letter sound relationships, those kinds of things. It's very clear how you're going to have to instruct that. And if you're not sure, you know, we have a lot of really great resources that you can go to um, to to help you understand what to do and how to monitor that progress um, to ensure that students are moving forward. There they all come. I like the scope and sequence. It's so clear where students have to go. And I know a lot of boards have been doing work around sco um, uh, scope and sequence for, um, for their schools in terms of early literacy instruction. And I think I'm just going to move us forward from here. There are a lot of great ideas, and I think people know um, what we're getting at here. I'm watching the clock a little bit, Allison, so I think we're going to move forward just before um, we get into the, some of the final slides. I did want to call attention to this chart, and um, we call this UNA's chart for assessment. And it comes from an, an article that UNA Malcolm, who's a PhD student in reading, um, did for us, I believe it was last year. And it's called Evidence-Based um, Assessment for Reading, and it's available on the Eldiot School website. But this is an assessment chart that she put together. And, you know, we've talked about assessment of and for learning for a long, long time. But Una does a really lovely job of um, putting this together and, and really trying to help us understand what a critical role assessment plays in informing and driving literacy instruction. And uh, so she created this table 
to help us learn and understand a little better how and when to use universal screeners, diagnostic assessments, progress monitoring, and outcome evaluation to guide our instruction and our interventions. So we put the links on there and I'd, I'd really encourage you to um, have a closer look at that chart and uh, print it out and um, use it uh, to support your instruction as well. Alison. Thank you, Martin. Um, sorry, I'm just having a little bit of trouble here. Here we go. So basically what we're, um, we're, we're ending today on just realizing that struggling readers do not have time for a wait and see approach. Um, this can really set up a student for a lifetime of reading and ac academic struggles. So even more than that, a, a delay or a delaying intervention can lead to poor grades, a negative attitude towards school, behavior problems, low self-esteem, and the list goes on. So instead, what would be important is that there are weekly or bi-weekly progress um, monitoring, monitoring that, uh, that happens, sorry, I sound so French today, <laughs> um, that allows for enough data to quickly and clearly establish patterns. And then we can go from there. Um, this way as well, um, educators can quickly judge if a child's rate of progress is strong enough to meet the goal or meet the goals. If not, there are several options that can be considered to intensify or to, to, to make that instruction even better. So we can talk about things such as increasing the frequency or the length of support. We can talk about decreasing group size. Uh, making groups more um, more of the same. We can talk about increasing level of explicitness and increasing, of course, opportunities for practice. And I think that's that's a big one. And with that, we we really talked a lot about next steps. Um, Alice and I, and even Susanna was in there with us and saying, you know, we know that it's really time to change our practice. We, we need to really look at what is happening in our classrooms, particularly around early literacy. We know that if we move to evidence-based instruction and we embrace uh, the, you know, the science of reading, that it's quite possible that we would be able to reach up to 95% of our students, which is just an amazing number um, when you see that and think about how we've been doing in Ontario over the, the, the last 20, 25 years. And that brings us to our controversial statement of the day. And funny, there's a little bit of action on Twitter about this. And, you know, we can assure you, Alison and I are not um, advocating for the removal of IEPs from the Ontario education system. But we really did have a serious conversation to say, if we are, you know, really delivering a well-planned and executed evidence-based reading program, do we need an IEP for reading? Because if 95% of, of our students are able to achieve based on the kinds of supports that they would receive in that program. So that would mean you know, that um, they're getting screened regularly. They're using the multi-tiered system of support. So the tier one or the foundational uh, classroom instruction, tier one, tier two, tier three, that's gonna leave very, very few students that are requiring that kind of intensive support that I think the IEP was really intended for in the first place. So we're looking at you know a small group of children um, that would require that, require that. Sure, they would still need an IEP for accommodations and modifications, allowing them to access the curriculum and other subject areas. But we do know that in terms of reading, that really good instruction is going to meet the needs of most of our students. And that brings us back to uh, one of our starting slides here. And if you remember that, this is the statement that we started with. It said, why an IEP? And uh, so we played around with a little bit of editing in this slide to say, an I, like an IEP question mark, when most students can have their educational needs met through regular evidence-based instruction and assessment practices in our schools. And we think that's really where we were hoping to land today is to say that, you know, we, we need to be really thoughtful about the tools that we use to support students, uh, struggling students, dyslexic students, students with learning disabilities, all of the students that, that sit before us in a classroom and make sure that, that when we use them, and Alison said it really well, because we've been discussing, you know, this, 
like what is an IEP? Well, an IEP is nothing until it's actually in the hands of an educator, right? It may be a legal document, it may be a lot of things, but it's going to be successful when it's in the hands of someone who cares and someone who has the, the right tools um, to move a student forward. So we hope that we've been able to, uh, to um, stimulate a little bit of thinking and a little bit of discussion for you as you move forward and particularly as we start thinking about next year. Um, I think we have a little bit of time if there's any questions or comments, but on behalf of Allison and uh, me, I'd like to say thank you very much for your time. We've really enjoyed it and thank you for your participation. And we'll turn it back over. Or, Allison, any final comments? No, I think that finishes everything well, but definitely we have our emails here on um, the screen. So if you do have any questions or concerns or if there's anything that uh, you feel you would like to discuss further, then, you know, we're always available. All right. Thank you so much for that lovely presentation. I think I know I'm thinking more about this than I ever have. So I'm sure our audience feels the same way. I have gotten a few questions through the Q&A box and through the chat. Um, but if anyone else has additional questions at this time, please put them in and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, let's start with one from the Q&A box um, where we have a parent who was talking about their experiences with their school board. So this person said that they're being told that their child does not have goals or frequency of interventions listed on the IEP. And they're told that this, this is because their child has accommodations and not modifications. Is this standard across school boards? And how do you feel about that statement? Let's start there. Um, so, um... There might be some parts that Martin will be able to better um, answer. When it comes to being standard across boards, I'm not 100% sure, but I do know that in a lot of boards, um, there are IEPs that have only accommodations, whereas there are others that have accommodations and modifications. So when we talk about modifications, it's because there's modifications to the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when there's just accommodations, they're either um, environmental um, accommodations or assessment or evaluation accommodations. I'm not going to try to say pedagogy in English <laughs> um, <Pedagogy>. accommodations <laughs> as well. Um, so it is a reality um, that there are different types of, of IEPs um, and then every school board implements them. Um, differently and, and different boards do work differently with how they how they use these accommodations versus modification type mm -hmm. of IEPs. But would you say that if they only have modification or only have accommodations, they don't need the goals section then? So I would say it's a hard question to answer oh, yeah. in the sense that um you know, my personal and professional thought is that uh, it would be nice because I saw the question in the in the Q &A mm -hmm. and she asks about you know, you know, without talking about goals, but you know, what about frequency and um, et cetera for the accommodations? And I think that isn't a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, to know that you know when are these accommodations? Not just what types of accommodations, for example, environmental versus like assessment accommodations. But when are they being put into place? And the way that I view accommodations in an IP is that this should be accommodations that are above and beyond mm -hmm. what is done in the classroom on a daily basis. Um, and that it's they're, they're specific to that child. So it's not something that the teacher is necessarily doing for all the kids, because then that's just good tier one, you know, intervention in the classroom. Um, so if we're going to be specific and give a specific accommodation in regards to a child's specific need or needs, then I do agree that, you know, some more information as to frequency or the implementation would be a good idea. That is not how the IEP works at the moment, but yeah. I do think that it is a valid point to bring to the table. Thank yeah, you. I would agree. And I would just say there was a comment in there, I think, uh, that says that, you know, 
terms of accommodations on an IEP, they're really accommodations to help them achieve the regular goals of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So those would be the goals. But I agree with you. The problem is that it doesn't help you with behavioral uh, goals or, you know, goals around the use of uh, frequency use of, uh, of AT and so many other things. So, yeah, it's another webinar in the making, Allison, that one, I think. Perfect. More work for you guys in the future. Um, on the same topic, you, you briefly touched on the idea that, you know, school boards do it very differently from school board to school board, and they have different exemplars and templates and some use, you know, different software to write them. Uh, what do you do if your school board is very prescriptive in how the IEP needs to be written? We talked about making it more specific. I've heard of some school boards that have drop down menus. How would you make that more specific? So I'm going to let Martin answer this one <laughs> okay. because yeah. we've discussed yeah. it and I really we, like yeah. the thought process. <laughs> If I can remember what I said, yeah, we did. We discussed this and knowing that, you know, there are a lot of drop down menus. And um, I think that, you know, where we we kind of came into agreement, Alice and I, where we said it's 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 not the, the drop down menus that that bring that IEP alive. So if you're if you're confined to using specific terms um, within the IEP, it doesn't stop an educator from making their own notes um, around that individual child. So whether it's even on a, a sticky note, you know, on your daybook or something to say, yeah, they, they, it, it may be like we said, you know, in um, something, a very general term, um, but you know more specifics about the child. So when you do the programming, you're going to have to work maybe in a different way to bring that IEP alive and make sure that um, even though it's not reflected in the actual document, it's reflected in, in the instruction. Is that? That was great. Yeah. <laughs> um, just mindful of the time. We've gotten a little bit over already, but I'm going to squeeze in one last question because I love to give people their money's worth, even though this is free. Um, we had a great statement in the uh, chat here um, that the information you're sharing might apply to students in sort of tier one that are falling behind their peers without quite getting to tier two, tier three. Uh, what about the students who are possibly beyond grades two and three, have gotten through these grades without actually getting the reading skills they need? What would you be putting on their IEPs? Can it just be accommodations or would there have to be modifications? Well, I think I just wanted to, to, to poke in first of all is to say, so so we know that that Tier one, tier two, and tier three are parts of evidence-based instruction of good reading instruction at any level, mm -hmm. right? So, so um, there's also a comment here about remediation is required to improve phonological processing and processing speed. I mean, those are really big statements that <laughs> you know that would almost require a, a, a lot of unpacking as well. But what we're talking about are you know students in a regular classroom that are getting different types of um, of uh, intensity of instruction, different amounts of time of instruction based on their specific needs. So, so of course, those tiers have got to change. But, um, you know, the person who said what happens after grade two and grade three, well, that's where we are in the province right now, obviously. And, you know, we know that the province is investing very heavily in that K to three area. There are some boards that are doing a lot of really interesting work around the intermediates, um, the junior, the junior limits, and even the secondary, um, where we're starting to see, you know, the use of the resource room, for instance, in, in secondary schools are starting to be used to help work on tier three or tier, tier two instruction for students who are coming, say, out of an English class and are really struggling with 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 reading, whether it's decoding or it's fluency or comp, and they're able to to really start spend some regular and consistent time with those students because they now know what the skills are because they're able to use tools like screeners and appropriate um, or you know oral. Uh, 
reading fluency assessments, phonological assessments, so they know exactly what the deficits are with those students. And I think the answer to moving beyond grade three, yeah, that's a perfect place for an IEP. But again, it needs to be specific to say, these are the missing skills that we have in this students. These are what need to be retaught or remediated in order for them to move forward. And in the past, we didn't have that information at our fingertips. We were still saying, you know, they're going to be fluent reader. They're going to reread you know, the same text 100 times or whatever until they're good at it. And I think that now it's about spec uh, being specific and understanding what those decoding skills are in the order that they need to be um, learned in order to be efficient. Allison? Well, actually, I was going to add to that, but uh, Jennifer in the chat actually stole my idea. <laughs> and um, she says it really well. She says, if true universal design for language existed in the classrooms to support all students, IEPs could focus on the student that has specific needs over and above that being provided by the UDLs. Um, so that's a bit what I was saying before with, you know, if the accommodations that work for all the kids um are are being met then the IEP is really reflecting you know those accommodations that are above and beyond and they may be those accommodations that go to that tier two or tier three tier three child uh, in that sense I also wanted to take the the this opportunity um someone made the comment the issue is that in order to have an IEP with modification is diagnosis uh, is is needed or needs to be made by appropriate professional. So I echo what Ian answered, where I think that is board dependent, because I know at my board, um, there are a lot of kids who have, or students, I should say, who have IEPs and that do not necessarily have a diagnosis, and they can still have an IEP with accommodations or with modification as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this presentation. That unfortunately is all the time we have for today. Um, so I'd like to just say thank you again to Martin and Allison and all our audience. Um, if anyone in our audience still has questions for our experts here or about anything <laughs> LD related, Martin hates being called an expert. I don't know for he's, experts. <laughs> he's our resident genius. Um, if you do have additional questions, you can always email us anytime, info at ldatschool.ca or find us on Twitter. Um, and another big old thank you. Keep a, an eye on your inbox tomorrow morning. You'll get a follow-up email. I put this in the chat, but I will restate it for anyone who hasn't seen it. Um, included in that email will be the links to the Jamboard so you can revisit them. I will also include a copy of Una's evidence-based assessment cheat sheet. And if there are any other documents that aren't included that you would like, you can always just respond to the email I send tomorrow. So with that, I'm going to call it a night and thank you all for attending. Have a great evening. Have a great thank evening. Thank you very much.